It was a Wednesday night when I received a text message from my older brother, Michael. Tell everyone I love them, goodbye. The coroner put his time of death at 8.12, the text posted at 8.06, which meant he was standing on the roof when he sent me his final message, just moments before he jumped six stories, crashing into the pavement. In the weeks and months that followed the news reports of his suicide, I learned more about my friends and neighbors than I ever thought possible. People came up to me and offered personal details of a loved one who struggled with mental health. And far too many had lost a brother, a daughter, an aunt, a parent to suicide. It was jarring, but once I had joined the Survivors Club, a club I don't wish gets any new members, I became a safe person for people to share their own family struggles with mental health and suicide. In our family, we all thought Michael was tough as nails, and the last person anyone would have predicted would have lost the battle to depression. As a gay man growing up in New Jersey in the 1970s, my brother learned to be tougher than everyone. He was combative and confident. But circumstance and depression overpowered his resolve and desire to live, and I was helpless to help him. I actually called the police on him just before his first suicide attempt, and we had him live with us after his first intervention. It was confusing, frustrating, and sad as we navigated his final six months alive where he was in and out of three different county hospitals on three different short-term 14-day holds. At one of the hospitals, I was shocked and disturbed when his doctor told me there was nothing we could do to stop him if he was determined to kill himself. To this day, those words from the person charged with helping Michael still makes me angry. Having lost his business and his health insurance, Michael was a broken man in a broken healthcare system. Although I knew he was still a threat to himself, I wasn't able to convince his doctors to keep him locked up. At all three hospitals, he was evaluated and set free on his 14th day of confinement, the day hospitals were required by law to either release him or keep him on a long-term psychiatric hold. As his closest relative, I was never notified when those evaluation hearings were held and I had no opportunity to pro protest his release. Now, I refuse to believe that had he had insurance, he would have been kept inside, received the care he needed, and not have been released. But frankly, it's hard not to be cynical. It's hard not to feel the system was not set up to help him. Every day, I live with the guilt of failing to protect and help my brother when he needed me most. I scrutinize my decisions I made during that time, and I wonder if I could have done more or done something differently. Now, watching my mother Barbara's rapid decline after his death added to my survivor's guilt. She was Michael's best friend and protector. He was the gay middle son, and Barbara was the Italian widow who made it her life's mission to protect him. Since his death, I've changed state law surrounding family notification of commitment hearings and promoted suicide prevention on our school campuses. If you see the suicide hotline number printed on your son or daughter's school student ID card, thank my brother. He's the reason why I use the time I have in the legislature to try to prevent more suicides. But there was nothing miraculous about my brother jumping six stories to his death. It rocked our family, took a dec decade off my mother, and keeps me channeling my guilt productively. But I'm here to tell you miracles do happen. Michael's suicide occurred several days before I was set to leave on a trip to Israel. My first thought was to cancel the trip. But my mother, being mom, said, Anthony, it's a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Don't cancel, and we can deal with Michael's service when you come back. So I went to the Holy Land and visited the holiest sites in the world. From Masada to Jerusalem, everything in Israel was special, enveloped in centuries of history. But there was one and only one place where something magical happened directly to me. In Nazareth, at the Basilica of the Annunciation, a spirit, a presence, came through me and touched my soul. It knocked the wind out of me and caused me to sit down in the pew where I spent about 45 minutes collecting myself. It was something I can never forget, but didn't dwell on when I came home the very next day. The morning after I returned, 
Michael's neighbors hosted a funeral mass at a Carmelite monastery down the street from his house in San Diego. So on the drive from LA, my mother expressed her fear that Michael's suicide would prevent him from entering heaven. The priest must have read the concern in her eyes because his sermon dispelled her worry. He explained that God understood that people who commit suicide are not competent to be judged and would be accepted in heaven with love and peace. It was a comforting message and well received by my mom and might have been seen as a mere miraculous coincidence. But what followed was even more special. Carmelite sisters are cloistered nuns who vow to remain inside their covenant, convent. They sit behind a screen, are devoted to prayer, and outsiders are generally not permitted into their quarters. After the service, the priest approached my mother and me and shared that the prioress of the monastery had a message for us and wanted us to go into the convent. I explained that my mom was not mobile enough to navigate from the church to the nuns' quarters. So moments later, the prioress of the cloister came out of cloister and delivered the most amazing message. She said, I need to tell you that your son is resting comfortably in our mother Mary's arms. I need to tell you that your son is resting comfortably in our mother Mary's arms. The fact that the nun understood my mother's fears was much more than a coincidence. Her words explain the miracle that occurred 30 hours before when I was in the basilica the church in Nazareth was constructed on the hallowed ground where the angel Gabriel informed Mary that she would be the mother of God. It was Mary's church. The nun's pronouncement told me that the presence I felt in that church was Mary speaking to me just as she had communicated with the nun who I had never met before. Michael's suicide, like all suicides, affected our family beyond the tragic decision in his early death. It took a toll on my mother. Parents should not outlive their children, and my mother struggled after he was gone. His death took years off her life. When she died, I detailed her love and devotion for Michael in her obituary. I wrote about how her mother's love created such a big comfort zone that she influenced my Rush Limbaugh conservative-leaning relatives, and because of Barbara's strength, everyone embraced and accepted and loved Michael. Because of my mother, everyone, every member of our large traditional Italian Catholic family became gay-friendly and my mom would not have tolerated any other position. She even accompanied Michael on stage in Washington, D.C. during the massive 1993 Pride March where Michael spoke to a crowd of one million people. Several weeks after her obituary was published, I was at a well-attended party when a woman came up to me with tears in her eyes, and she said, I'm a conservative Republican, and my son is gay. Reading your mom's obituary makes me want to be a better mother for my son. She thanked me for sharing my mother and Michael's love story. An hour later, I ran into the woman's husband at the same party, and he came up to me with tears in his eyes, and he shared his own admiration and appreciation for mom, and he also vowed to be a better father for his son. So Michael and Barbara had a special bond, shared a tragic loss, but left us all better off for knowing them. I was lucky to have them in my life, and I look forward to my mother's next miracle.